500,000 girls by 2040. Project Scientist is all about inspiring young girls to be all that they would wish to be. We are literally going to try to educate and inspire the next generation of girls to be the leaders and the scientists and the engineers of tomorrow. All right, next I am pleased to introduce our leaders for the fireside chat. So Sandra Keats is a nationally recognized diversity and inclusion leader and the CEO of Paradigm for Parity. Sandra comes from Bank of America where she was the leading executive on DNI strategy in support of the CEO and chief diversity officer. Sandra also served as the head of DNI for Global Human Resources and was selected as one of 50 Black women for the Goldman Sachs 1 Million Black Women Impact Grant. She has been featured as one of this year's inspirational DNI leaders and has been named one of Diversity Women Elite 100 Black Women Leaders Class of 2022. Also joining us for this fireside chat is Jayshree Sait. Corporate scientist and leader of applied technology development for industrial adhesives and tapes at 3M, where she was also appointed their first ever chief science advocate. Jayshree holds her master's and PhD in chemical engineering from Clarkson University and currently holds 76 patents for a variety of innovations with several additional patents pending. She has also been awarded the Society of Women Engineers Highest Achievement Award and is also the first ever winner of the Gold Stevie Award as a Female Thought Leader of the Year. Jayshree was featured in a docuseries titled Not the Science Type that premiered at both the Tribeca and Sundance Film Festivals. She is the author of two books in her Heart of Science series with proceeds going to a scholarship for underrepresented minority women in STEM. This fireside chat will be moderated by a project scientist board member and CEO of Game On Nation, Blair Bloomstein. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Sandra. You got it. <laughs> I got it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you both so much for joining me. Can we get another round of applause for our amazing guests? So here we are to talk about your trailblazing accomplishments and the bios that were just read were incredible. But one of the things that Project Scientist does is takes this inspiration down to the youth level. I was curious for both of you, Sandra, I'll go to you first. Uh, if your 10 year old self were to give your bio, what are the headlines that she would speak about you? Yeah, so first of all, thank you so much for having me. And I was um, just such a pleasure to be here. Um, so if my 10 year old self, and so keep in mind, this, this is a 10 year old language. She has a really cool job where she gets to help people come to work and feel good about the work that they do and bring their whole selves. And she sometimes gets to make people feel uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> I love your your ten year old self is like very insightful. Yeah, <laughs> it's keeping it real. Yeah, Sri, what about you? How would your ten year old self describe your accomplishments? You know, as I'm listening to Sandra, I realize that this is a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Thanks for giving us that perspective because sometimes it's just easy to be so hard on yourself. Yeah, until you actually imagine your ten year old and you you think you know not bad. <laughs> <laughs> So my, uh, so thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, my 10 year old would actually not be surprised that I've, uh, uh, I'm in STEM because I grew up on the campus of an engineering institution. My dad was actually an engineering professor. And so the boys and girls, everybody was really encouraged uh, to go into engineering because the campus, I mean, we lived on it and it's like, where would you rather go? Right here, right here. <laughs> And so I was kind of pushed into that that area and um, I never thought of myself as the science and engineering type. So 
I think my 10 year old uh, self would be like, oh, so you did all right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, uh, what 10 year old would not be impressed with? So you've written books, you've been in a movie, yeah. you wrote a song. So I'm <gasps> feeling pretty cool right now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I hope that all of you just take a second and think about your 10 year old self. Maybe sit like if you were 10 and here at this event. Um, and it leads me to kind of my next questions for you, because we're really talking about the future. And uh, so, Jayshree, I want to go to you. You work at 3M. Um, you have these amazing background and credentials. You are chief science advocate there. And something that is an initiative that I know you really lead is the state of science report. I'd like to know about the recent report that came out and kind of how it connects to project scientists and what we're here for today. Yeah, so that would be something that the 10 year old would be freaked out to know. No. <laughs> and I'm actually the chief science advocate for somebody who started out not thinking they were the science and engineering type. That's quite the stretch. Uh, but so if we back up, uh, we at 3M, we care about science. Science matters to us and we wanted to understand what the world thought, thinks about science. And I would have thought they think that it's pretty good. It's important and all that good stuff. Well, we did a survey, 14 countries, 1000 respondents per country. And the results were very interesting. I don't know how many of you know in Midwest when you say interesting what that really means. <laughs> but I will tell you, uh, four out of 10 surveyed said if science didn't exist, their lives would be no different. Four out of 10 surveyed said if science did not exist, their lives would not be any different. It's really jaw dropping. Now, get this. They were taking the survey on there. <laughs> so what's the problem? Science is underappreciated, science is taken for granted, and science is really invisible. That's the problem. And that's why at 3M they decided that we can't keep these survey results close to our west. We have to share it with others and foster a global conversation around this because this has serious consequences if people don't even know that what they're doing is so related to science. Mm. And then I got the call to be the chief science advocate and I freaked out just like my 10 year old <laughs> uh, because I'm like, mm, I will need to tell them I'm not a science and engineering type. I never secured admission to the very college for which I was you know, prompted by my parents to get into science. I've had my struggles through graduate school and I came into 3M through the back door as a summer intern. I'm going to have to tell them all that because I can't do this, you know. But I ended up taking that position. And essentially what we do is we try to address what we're finding from the survey. And it relates to making sure people acknowledge the role of science and moving that from this apathy that they seem to feel. A uh, second one is breaking down by, by um, you know, bias and barriers and boundaries. You know, science is not for me. I'm a girl or science is only for genius. Uh, right brain, left brain, stuff like that. And, and C, which is extremely important, so it's A, B and C. But the C that is really important to me is, is the context of science. And that's exactly why I wasn't excited about science, because nobody told me that it matched up exactly with what I wanted to do. It was help people solve problems, make the world a better place. So that context is so important in championing. So that's kind of my role as chief science advocate. Now, I have to mention that when we did the survey, we find that people say, yeah, we need more diversity in STEM fields. And seven out of 10 surveyed in 2022 said if we don't engage, inspire, invite more girls to STEM, that will have serious consequences. Oh. So that relates right up with the, the vision of Project Scientists to inspire more women and girls, and the girls should see themselves belonging in those fields, and yeah. that's why we want to change the world. Long okay. answer. It's, it's a great answer. Let's celebrate that answer. Okay, we're gonna stop. <laughs> I really appreciate that even when 40% didn't understand, like, this is science, but the, the sentiment is still that we have to do more. We have to bring girls and women in. Yeah, and that happened because of the pandemic. I skipped that part. So mm. science skepticism was actually rising steadily, but then when the pandemic hit, science was center stage. Scientists were in the public discourse and suddenly people were like, oh, I see how that works. Yeah. So that was the silver lining. Science is actually having its moment and that's why there was this recognition of diversity. And That's great. I, mean, I think recognition, awareness, right? This is part of how we solve for things. Hey, Rita, is it me? Okay, I can be really loud. Oh, it just fell off. Yeah, how about that? Hi, everybody. I'm back on the mic.
Um, Sandra, I want to take it to you as CEO of Paradigm for Parity, right? And I know for you it's it's gender equality, but also diversity coming in. And I would just love to know what you see as an ideal future where girls are more represented in STEM fields. Yeah, I, I think um, part of it has to really be around some of what you've heard here today. Number one, barriers have to be removed. And that's the difference between equity and equality, right? So equity is removing the barriers so that everyone has the opportunity to really um, take the opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. So that it's presented. I think another thing is a place where everyone can show up and be who they are and bring their best and brightest selves to the workplace or to any space. And that's inclusive of education, whether I am in middle school or I'm in elementary or I'm in high school or I'm at the college or university level. I think another thing is where we have to encourage companies and organizations to really support and promote inclusive leaders. And I think this also goes for teachers in the classroom. So what really makes an inclusive leader, someone who builds trust, who is transparent, who invests in their talent or their students, mm -hmm. and someone who cre creates opportunities for courageous conversations. And then I also think that, you know, every organization has a hierarchy, right? And so there's only one CEO, except for some organizations may have two, two CEOs, but that doesn't last very long. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was also, I was once told uh, um, anything with two heads is a monster. But, um, <laughs> That's just, but, um, but you know, what I'm saying is every organization has a hierarchy. And so I think the most important thing is when I show up to that organization, to that place, do I have a shot? Can I see myself there? Because I think that that's critically important. Whether I achieve that or not is not the, the challenge. The challenge is, is the environment inclusive enough where I feel like I have a shot? Mm. Well, this leads me to kind of a second question for you, Sandra, which is what do businesses need to do in the future? And this really lines up with Project Scientist yeah. to create a space. If, if she'll be ready with us, what do businesses need to do to say we'll be ready to? Absolutely. So I think this kind of comes full circle for me because when I was younger from the time I can remember all the way up to probably high school, I wanted to be a scientist. Mm. Well, I'm not a scientist. And I had to really think about why. Why didn't I pursue that? And part of it was, number one, I didn't have role models. And I think that that's critically important. You cannot be what you cannot see. Mm -hmm. And so I, I didn't feel that that was a space for me. The other thing is I didn't have something like Project Scientist either. And another thing that they do, which I love what you do, is you provide education and access. So not only educating the students or the girls, and this is the same thing for organizations and companies, a lot of times when women are not um, being pulled through the pipeline mm -hmm. in ethnically underrepresented talent is because they're not giving exposure or education or access to those areas they don't have sponsorship mm -hmm. and you have to intentionally have sponsorship in order to ensure that that diverse talent makes it to the top. And a lot of people will say, well, I didn't have sponsorship. Well, if you are a white male and you are a CEO of a company or you are chief information officer of a company, I promise you, you had sponsorship because that's the only way that anyone really makes it. Someone sat at a table and said that person, I think we should promote that mm -hmm. person we should give an opportunity to be developed that person we should provide the the um, exposure to so that we can continue to create a path forward for their career or that opportunity and last but not least which I think is so incredibly incredibly important especially for women is the confidence mm -hmm. the confidence to say you can do this this is for you and someone to run air cover when we make mistakes or we fall down to, to ensure us that that's okay. Yeah. It doesn't make us bad at whatever we're doing. It just means we need to get back up, learn from that mistake and keep moving forward. And that's some of what the workplace needs to provide along with a bunch of other things I'm sure we can all talk about for <laughs> work, benefit, pay and all of that. But I think that that's what Project Scientist does for young women mm. and that will create that path forward.
I appreciate that so much. It not only combines what everybody who is here in this room is already doing, which is showing up as individuals, but it's a call to action for us to make sure that there's space in our work organizations where people can feel that belonging and mentorship Absolutely. and sponsorship happens. Absolutely. Awesome. You know, Jayshree, I got to go back to you. You have done the work, 76 patents, 76 patents. Yeah, in addition to, yeah, okay, yes, let's do that. Let's, let's highlight these things. Yes, so much brilliance up here. So you've done that, but you also have become such a storyteller on behalf of the movement, right? Two books, this docu-series, not the science, like a song that you mentioned. I mean, yeah, I want to know more. What is uh, the power of storytelling when we're talking about showcasing women leaders in STEM fields? Yeah, it's incredible. I think storytelling is something that our brains just soak up. And the uh, funny thing is people inundate you with facts, evidence, and data and miss the storytelling piece. And so to me, that is a powerful way to shape people's thinking. And so uh, my thinking was shaped when uh, 2020 happened, and I'm referring to the social justice uh, reawakening. And the epicenter was where I live, it was right in our backyard. And it made me sort of think about my role in this as a very privileged South Asian immigrant. Where do I stand on this? And uh, I didn't know much about the systemic aspect of what was going on, and I educated myself, and I kept feeling guilty about why I didn't know all this. And uh, after that, to me, it was, you have to be productive with purpose. That's, that's the one thing you can do. But what can one person do? You always find yourself asking. And I just decided I'm going to do it. So I took all the essays that I have written, and I called the Society of Women Engineers CEO. I cold called. And I said, uh, let's publish all of these, and I want all proceeds to go for a scholarship for underrepresented minority women in STEM, Black, Latinx, and Indigenous. And they said, done. And I wow. had this whole story prepared of how I'm going to do the persuasive writing from the 10 year old, you know. <laughs> um, she said, no, it's done. So we published the first book. And uh, I was out there, you know, promoting it, and, and we were able to generate enough sales that we were able to support the first student. And then in 2021, when the first time I could step out after vaccines and stuff, I got uh, invited to give the Silas Ethics Lecture at Georgia Tech. So I show up there and I find out that the first recipient of the scholarship selected to go to Georgia Tech. It's a sign. It's a sign. <laughs> I'm one of those people, you know, so I got to meet this young, uh, young black woman who's pursuing mechanical engineering at Georgia Tech. She's probably still wondering why I was crying. I'm a crier. <laughs> and uh, as soon as I sat on the flight and on my way back, I'm like, I can't stop here. I, I can't stop here. I was just fired up. So I'm telling you, one person can make a difference. If you ever think you cannot mm -hmm. rewrite that story, one person can make a difference because others join. And that's what happened. So I wrote another one, took all my essays again that I had written through the pandemic, you know, looking at reflections and transitions and actions that each one of us can take. And so I'm very happy to have the support today for the book as well. And uh, now we have a second student who has been selected. So wow. it's, it's incredible what what and it's a win win. So spread the word and uh, we can give the gift of education. And the movie came about because of what Sandra mentioned, role models. Mm. So how do you highlight those role models that people think are accessible and are diverse. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's why when the data came out and it said, you know, 88% people agree that we need more diversity in STEM. And it's important because it's not just about the practice of science anymore. It's also who are the practitioners and people are asking that, right? It's not just about the policy, but the politics. And it's not just people as a monolith, but the perceptions and that can lead to action or inaction. So we created this docu-series. It highlights four diverse women and their journeys in STEM. So we have, uh, you know, people who were trailblazers in their community, people who have shaped their careers to their interests, people who have, uh, you know, uh, just gone after science without even having a degree. I'm speaking about Gitanjali Rao, who's the time kid of the year. 
and then it had my story. My interest in STEM it was like the last interest I had. I was so much interested in humanities and the human context and never realized how critical that was for problem solving. And I link it back to the patents that I have mm -hmm. because you bring that thinking about the user and how this is going to appeal. What is the problem to solve? And then you go about solving it and you realize that you have an innovation there. So that's how it kind of all ties together. And it was just a phenomenal experience to be part of the docuseries. So we want to inform, influence and inspire mm. that you can change these constructs and you can dismantle those archetypes of who it is that you know, enters who it is that persists and who it is that excels in STEM. We've got to rewrite that story. That's so good. You know, part of when you were talking, Jayshree, you talked about role models and Sandra, I saw you nodding and I have a bonus question for you. Yeah, because I'd love to just hear you speak from the heart. I know that you're fostering this in your work that you do. What makes a great role model? What helps somebody who is an adult get through to someone who's young and hopeful? Yeah, I, you know, I think a role model um, is someone, a great role model in my, in my opinion, is someone who shows up and is authentic. Um, people connect and can connect with people on a very personable, personal level. Mm. Um, I think it's great that you may have accomplished a lot, but it's also understanding where people are and helping to raise them to your level. And it's a person that lifts as they climb. Um, and, and willing to share and, and be open and understand that um, one of my favorite quotes is by Mahatma Gandhi who said, the um, beauty of being human is being humane. And I may not have gotten that quote exactly right, but, but it, is, it is a person who is just, who understands and values all parts and pieces of who we are mm -hmm. and, and willing to um, help support others in their journey. Oh, let's clap for that. I love that. Thank you. I put you on the spot. You know, as both of you are talking, I hope that you and the audience are continuing that kind of, if I was 10 and taking in this information, how would I feel? How charged up would I be? And I want to end with the question for both of you. Sandra, I'll go to you first again, and Jayshree, I'm going to get you for closing thoughts. But if you were 10 up here, I was with you, very enthusiastic at 10, and, and I asked you to give everybody in this audience a call to action of what we need to do about it, right? Specifically related to project scientists, what do we all need to be thinking about? What steps do we need to be taking? What would your 10 year old self give us as advice? Yeah, so again, remember this is from a 10 year old's perspective. <laughs> and I would say, listen, there's enough room on the playground for everybody and there's enough equipment for us all to play together and let's play nice in the sandbox and go out and have fun together. I love it. Yes. Awesome. How about you, Jayshree? Uh, my 10 year old would, uh, was very subdued and uh, hard to believe, uh, but my uh, parents always said, uh, be good, work hard, be good, work hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I just internalized that till I realized the genius of parenting. You never know if you're being good enough and you never know if you're working hard enough. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, be good, just mm -hmm. be good mm -hmm. yeah. and work hard. Mm -hmm. Just be good, work hard. And I've added after I've grown from 10 to live well as well. Yeah. Mm. That's critical. So be good, work hard, live well. Love Wonderful. You. Clap it out for our guests, everyone. Thank you both very much. All right, we're going to head off the stage now. After you. Project sciences is the future. I've been doing project science since it's about the first grade, which will be about six, seven, eight years. I would like to be an engineer because we had a lot of women engineer come. There's nothing girls can't do. I'd like to go back and do it again as an older kid and do the older kids' experiments. That would be fun. Um, I think it was fun to never have like a direct set of instructions because it gave us a minute to like, that was my work and I thought of that idea. I think that it like showed me that I'm really smart and that it left it open for just like, what can I create with myself? And I think that just gave me a different confidence at school.
Um, I'd probably say thank you for making it clear that there's multiple paths I could go down. It was like really interesting to know my choices. Good afternoon. I'm Sandy Marshall. I'm founder, CEO of Project Scientist. And um, being here at Lowe's, once you get upstairs to the 25th floor, you're going to see the whole city. And it's really a three, um, I don't know, a full, six, full circle moment for me because I started it right down the street um, in my backyard with six girls 10 years ago. And now we're serving girls all over. So it's really fun to be in this building and see that. Um, and we can also see our first university campus, Queens University. So um, to now know that we're all over um, serving girls and it started right here in Charlotte and um, to have this view is phenomenal. Um, and I'm here with one of our amazing scientists, um, Paige. Um, and as a mom of four, I started Project Scientist because I had a need. And, um, you know, it's so proud to hear Jessica's story. And we're going to see a little video and, and see um, Paige's story as well and hear from her. Even though I enjoy science, um, I have like a lot of other stuff that I do. I do gymnastics. I like to do art and I also play cello and piano. At Project Science School, well, what I remember was I was in either like kindergarten, like first grade. You get to have really fun and experiment and, and play at the park. No one else gets to do that, not even the grown-ups. I really liked it because I, I got to come back every year and like the people like remember me. The speakers are really good and they showed us like experience. Project Scientist also gives me more confidence in school. It gave me like a better understanding of what we do now. I think that STEM girls really do change the world. So um, Paige, if you haven't watched that full video of Paige talking about the Coke and Mentos experiment, it's on our YouTube site. You should start every morning with that video because it's so cute and inspiring. Um, so we're so honored to have you here today, Paige. And it's been interesting to schedule this because she's such a good student. And um, we had to send someone over to pick her up to make sure she didn't miss her first class. She may not be able to stay for lunch because she's got to get back for, you can stay. Okay, all right. Um, so unlike my kids who they would be missing the whole day. So, um, yeah, you could go Paige. Um, but it's been so amazing to see you grow up. And I remember Queens University when you were that tiny little girl in those huge lab um, chairs and your curiosity was endless and um, that spunky little girl. And to see you grow up now at 13 and um, to see what you've become in the, in the dreams you have. Um, so she's gonna help me present some awards today. Um, so the first award is for Duke Energy. And how many um, expeditions do you think you've been on with Duke Energy? Three or four. And met maybe 20 women from Duke Energy over the years, yeah. And like my mom's friends is like from Duke Energy, like Cameron Charlie, she's really nice. Nice. So um, we're going to present our award to Duke Energy and our Volunteer of the Year as well. Um, but before we do that, we do have a big announcement as well. Um, on November 8th, we started a campaign to raise $400,000 um, for STEM girls. And we're about halfway there. Um, but today we have a special announcement. One of our board members is going to match up to $60,000. So um, I hope everybody at home and um, here in the room, very easy to donate. You can just text STEM22 STEM to 44321. You can also go um, on the QR code and go to our website. So, um, so we can support more girls like Jessica and Paige and continue the work of Project Scientist. And today your donations will be doubled. So thank you, Julie, for supporting us. Um, okay, so Paige and I are going to present this award. Um, and of all the women maybe you've met over the years, Paige, how, um, do you have a memory of someone that really has inspired you? Uh, like when I was like six, I went to the um. We, I think we went to like the marine biology thingy, and we were like 
doing, I don't know, it was like a little starfish in like a sea ray. And like when the workers came up to me and she told me like all about like the sea rays and like all the sea animals. And so I was like marine biology. Marine biology is your thing. Anything you'd like to tell the women in the room today, the STEM women? I think that they're doing like really, really good. And like, I want to be like that when I grow up. Yes, thank you all. Um, so, you know, Project Science is celebrating 10 years and we've grown all over the country. Um, our program has pivoted with COVID uh, and, um, you know, we've gone from serving girls in university campuses to now in schools. But the one thing that re has remained constant is Duke Energy. They've supported us since our first year. Um, they've supported us for 10 years, over $150,000 over the 10 years, dozens of expeditions, hundreds of women that have volunteered, um, even to producing STEM kits for us that we ship to the girls' houses over the holidays. Um, they have been a true partner and joined us in that first year as a small, tiny nonprofit and really validated our work. Um, so we have Shireen Pierce here today. Um, and Shireen is also one of our most inspiring volunteers. Um, she served as a STEM superstar, I'm sure at least maybe a dozen times. Um, she's been on committees. She has donated to us monthly for years now. Um, so, so excited to have you come up and accept this award on behalf of Duke Energy. daughter has blossomed into an international source of inspiration for so many students. As our nation and Duke Energy embarks on our clean energy transition, we know that students, young female students today, will be the STEM leaders of tomorrow. And it will be because of the inspiration and education that they receive from organizations just like project scientists. So yes, Duke Energy, we are proud to have been an early supporter and we will continue to support project scientists. Thank you so much for this recognition. Um, so just as Duke Energy has been a, a constant supporter of project scientists, there's one, been one volunteer that has also been that constant supporter. Um, Katie Sipkala was with Train Technologies um, and really organized the probably 20, 30 expeditions we've had over the years, the hundreds of trained volunteers that have volunteered with us. Um, she's now at LPL Financial and continues to be um, a huge advocate for girls in STEM. And she is here to accept the Volunteer of the Year Award. I do have a great story um, about Katie. Uh, we had done an um, expedition for Halloween, which we traditionally did for years at the train um, offices. And prior to Halloween, she was serving as a STEM superstar at our campus here in Charlotte. Um, and I remember we um, got off the bus and all the girls were coming into the train office and um, saw Katie and she was a celebrity, which is how Project Scientist is. Our STEM superstars are celebrities. And she came up to me um, at the end of the day and tears in her eyes and she's like, the girls remembered me. They remembered me from this summer and and they wanted to see my office and where I work. And, you know, it's so exciting. I was like, of course, Katie, like you are a celebrity, our STEM superstar. So I know for parents um, to have these women in the room inspiring their girls is super important. And we couldn't be more proud to give you the Volunteer of the Year Award. <laughs>
very lucky to have support throughout my career in STEM. Um, my journey with my parents, uh, they did, dealt with a lot of creatures in our backyard that I brought to our house uh, to my husband who thought he was marrying a CPA. When I went into technology, he was there for me. So that was amazing. Um, but it's really great to be able to support a younger version of myself. Um, Many moments from my project scientist highlight reel that I have in my head, that was definitely one of them. You talking to a reporter with a bird on your shoulder because we were dressed up. Uh, but another one really helped me understand the impact that volunteerism can have on these girls. And that was we were talking to one camper and her end of the year video, um, her remembrance from the summer was something I had told them when they asked, you know, for advice. What would I, what would I tell my younger self? And I told them that find the network, find the friends that build you, support you, are there for you. Um, those are gonna make you successful. Um, so it was really amazing to see them remember those things. You really do feel like a celebrity. Um, so volunteers, you do make a difference. You really do. And thank you for making it so easy to make a difference in these young girls' lives. Congratulations to Katie for Volunteer of the Year and Duke Energy. Your commitment to project scientists and supporting these girls in STEM is so inspiring. Um, and now we're going to have an opportunity to hear from leading women in STEM-based uh, careers that are right here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Our first panelist is Bonnie Tetone. She serves as the Chief Information Officer at Duke Energy and leads the company's information technology operations and infrastructure, cybersecurity and physical security functions, product delivery, and expanding the digital transformation and data optimization strategies. Bonnie also serves on the board of directors for Young Black Leadership Alliance and is passionate about access to education for diverse populations, expanding STEM programs, and mentoring women in technology. Renee Askew is also joining us from the city of Charlotte, where she serves as the Assistant City Manager and Chief Information Officer. Renee oversees technology, innovation, strategic planning, and critical operations. She is focused on shaping Charlotte's technologies, vision, strategy, and performance, and building on Charlotte's reputation as a top-ranked digital city that leverages technology to enhance the residents' experience, boost efficiencies, and increase our government transparency and innovation. She's also passionate about mentorship, helping professionals build self-confidence, and encouraging the pursuit of life-changing education and career opportunities. Our final panelist will be Deidre Fannis, Senior Vice President with m and Consulting and Board Member of SIM Charlotte Chapter and SIM Women in Tech. And I'm sorry, it's Deidre. Deidre Fannis has over 25 plus years of IT leadership and technology delivery with public and private companies of varying sizes and industries and consulting. Throughout her career, she has been both a recipient and a leadership mentor, helping to define and develop other technology professionals, promoting STEM development, particularly with girls and women of all ages, and has held a seat on the UNCC Women in Computing panel. This STEM panel will be moderated by Erica Moore, Vice Chair of the Project Scientist Board of Directors and Executive Director of the STEM Funders Network. Before serving as the Executive Director of the National STEM Funders Network, Erica was the Senior Program Officer at the Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta, leading the team focused on creating equity in education and workforce development for over 900,000 students. She has also been honored as an outstanding Georgia citizen by the Secretary of the State, a Woman of the Year by Atlanta's Women in Technology, an ecosystem builder by the Tech for Ally Alliance, as one of the top four inspires in America by Inspire Magazine, who's who in Black Atlanta and with several distinctions from her alma mater, the Georgia Institute of Technology. Let's hear it for this absolutely incredible panel. Thank you. 
So as we take our seats, if you could just for these amazing introductions and these women that you just were introduced to right by Morgan, just give them one more round of applause, please. Because like you, they are taking time out of their day to be here and to be a part of this conversation and to make sure that we're just walking away right with some perspective and for the audience that we have that are participating virtually in live stream, we can't thank you enough for doing the same. You are taking a moment to engage in a conversation and to be a part of the solution that Project Scientist is just a part of our mission. So ladies, thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your impact here in the city of Charlotte. Um, and again, we've had these great introductions and I promise you, and I promise you, Blair and I did not share our questions before we started this process but here we are with a similar question um and let's just put it in perspective right particularly as we have young ladies that may be watching this and paying attention to this conversation so if you were going to give advice to your k through 16 and i am in spreading it out a little bit right so that whole time frame k through college or higher education if you were to give yourself advice, what would it be? Anybody can start just where, you know, as you kind of reflect and you've had a moment to really think about this question. You know what, Bonnie, I'll start with you. Yeah, I can start. I would say have a plan and be ready to throw it out the window. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would, would tell myself. I, you know, as I think through my, my early life and then my college life and my career, I've always been kind of driven and passionate and a bit of an extrovert, which I think also, also helped a little bit. And I always had a plan for what I wanted to do or what my next step was or where I ultimately wanted to be. And what I found is you have to just have guideposts. Right? You can't be so stringent about the direction that you're going to go in because you will lose opportunities. You're going to lose perspective and experiences that frankly help you mold your career. So that would be my suggestion to myself. Have a plan, but re be ready to crumble it up and throw it out the window. <laughs> Pivot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Renee. So for me, um, so I grew up in North Philadelphia. And so I don't know if many of you are aware of the climate in Philadelphia and what it was. Well, I'm not going to age myself, but what it was like. Um, and so I would tell myself that those years grounded you, allow it to ground you because, you know, I grew up in an environment where we didn't have technology, so that wasn't the thing. Um, and so I grew up in a neighborhood. It was very difficult. It was very rough, but it also grounded me in perspective. And so the work that I do today around uh, digital inclusion, around diversity, um, is it's all grounded in where I grew up. So when I hear people talk about, hey, we just need to have labs around the city, that's great, but I was a latchkey kid. How would I get there? So I really look at from the perspective of how I grew up and how I can make sure that those opportunities are available for everyone. So just, just stay grounded in where you came from. Absolutely. Keep it real. Danger. What would I say to myself? Um, well, I grew up in an extremely rural area mm -hmm. of upstate New York. Um, people don't think that that's pretty rural, but a 450 acre crop farm. So I did not see technology around me other than tractors. Um, so probably what I would say is I always learned the value of hard work and dedication, as well as the value of just being kind and inclusive of, of uh, ideas and different things. Um, so I would probably tell myself that those are great values, forming relationships, communication, and making sure that you're, you're kind and you're driven and, and working hard um, probably are the, the best things. And, and I was pretty far from thinking about technology in, in the standpoint of STEM like we know it today. Right. Um, but I think that there are some remnants of that looking back in, in, in um, some of the things that I was brought up around and to do. No, thank you for all sharing, right? Your value system, uh, inclusiveness, staying grounded, having a plan and recognizing, be flexible with yourself with that plan. Um, those are the things that have really just have guided you, right? Throughout your career to the level of success that you've achieved here and now and for this time, because I know you still have other things that you're going to do in your, 
And I really love when reading your bios and even just watching you as you walked into the room, the connectedness that you have. I don't take it lightly, right, that all three of you are representing technology leadership in a city that's continuing to evolve and to really grow in that space. Um, there's a phrase, representation matters. Uh, and the three of you are representative of the epitome of what we want to share and encourage with this audience. When you think about, um, you know, if we go back 1999, yeah, 1999, where was I in 1999? IBM is actually where I was in 1999. But that's when actually the acronym STEM was presented. It was actually a marketing awareness opportunity, but since 1999 in your career trajectory, so Renee, I'm gonna start with you. What do you think has changed? What do you, what have you seen? What have you experienced either in your own career or just generally speaking, what's changed over that time frame? I think a lot has changed, honestly. Um, so just think about project scientists, you know, having programs like that, having opportunity for young girls to see uh, people in STEM, to see opportunities to learn about technology. I didn't learn about technology until I was exposed in college mm -hmm. and, um, and the world opened up for me. So how much more for those who get to see and experience it now? And so I think that has changed a lot. Um, I was reading a statistic uh, recently, and there was a couple of them, and, and one talked about uh, 3 million new jobs in STEM by 2025. And then another, I think it was a Forrester article that talked about by uh, 2035 to be 11 million new tech jobs. That's staggering. And so when you hear that and you think about the opportunity we have in front of us to make sure that no man, woman, or child left behind with, mm -hmm. with respect to technology, man, there's just a huge opportunity for us. And so I believe that programs um, like this one makes a difference. I think the opportunity to see people in leadership like yourself model the behavior, model the opportunity, I think that's tremendous and will provide a tremendous value to, to our community. And that has changed since 1999. Wow, how impactful. David, how would you answer that question? Well, besides the phase of coming out of my heather, my feathered hair, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, in seriousness, um, I think there has been a lot that's changed and continues to change, which is encouraging. Mm -hmm. That may be not at the pace that we want it to, but um, I remember when I first, I went to work first for uh, Kraft General Foods, Kraft Food Service, and um, back then it seemed that any technology career I was in a technology department, seemed to push women toward those more administrative tasks yep. um, and seemed to, even, even if it wasn't your job duty, then a lot of times, whatever was happening in a project or a meeting, it was tagging the woman in the room to handle those administrative tasks. So I think there's a little bit of change that's going on in that sense, where that's not always the case. Um, and like Renee said, I think more support organizations or organizations that are focused in being intentional and authentic around women in technology and the support and, and being able to show girls like Paige and others, you know, this is what I do. Um, the other thing I want to mention too is that oftentimes I think I have a daughter who is 11 and when they think technology and STEM, that it has to be coding or development. It's not always the case. Okay. I've actually never touched a piece of code myself. I've actually been project management, business analysis, quality assurance, leadership. There's a lot of uh, roles within a STEM organization, within technology careers that can take you into different types of um, jobs and positions and, and so forth. So I think that that knowledge and making that awareness is also changing. Great point. No, I, I appreciate how you all are drawing out, right, um, what was and what's now, uh, the mindsets, 
that have changed and have evolved because all of that's critical. When we talk about representation matter, all of those things from a systems perspective have to be in play. It's we can do so much through project scientists, but there are things systematically that have to evolve and change. So I appreciate you for calling those out. Bonnie, haven't forgotten. Yeah, about I agree you. with everything that both of them said. I think the other thing is you know, companies now appreciate diversity more. They have metrics and goals around it. It's things that everybody has to pay attention to, whether they want to or have to, they're doing it. And I think that certainly is something that has helped open some doors. I think on the other side of it too, is I think as the industry evolves, there's roles and jobs that get created that didn't exist many years ago. And what we're working on now and the roles now are gonna look very different five years from now or 10 years from now. And all of that, I think, lends to that really great ability to think for diversity around who am I going to hire, who's the right fit for that, because I think it, it really ties to the point around the traditional role. It doesn't have to be the traditional role. There's the, the next thing I think they think come into the industry. So I think the coupling of the number of jobs increasing, the types of jobs increasing, and then just the diversity of, of talent pool, both recruiting and kind of uh, creating a bench, I think are also helping uh, drive this change between where we were in 1999, where you know I felt found myself in a room being the only female for many, many years in technology to now uh, seeing the seats at the table filled with a great number of diversity. I think that's why we're able to deliver better and why you see better ideas coming to the surface and solving really complex problems. We need to do more of that. We need to do more of that, absolutely. Let's give it up for those three responses right there, right? Just, I'm saying going back down memory lane and bringing us forward. I appreciate you for just, again, that woo and just kind of, you know, reveling in that. And so now I want us to reflect on, um, and I know, right, so I'm just going to set the stage because I know it's difficult sometimes for us to engage in talking through the, the negative realities, but, um, and, and I appreciate, you know, for for, for Sandra and for Jay Street, just how they talked about just some of these uncomfortable conversations that we might have to have. So I'm gonna set the stage and I'm gonna go off script a little bit, but the question will still be the question you receive, but I'm, I'm gonna go off script for a little bit because before I sent you this last question, um, I hadn't had this experience. This literally happened to me last week, last Thursday. I was coming out of a leadership council meeting for a statewide organization and the father approached me. He's seen, you know, had had a senior executive career at a Fortune 500 organization, technology career, 12 year old daughter. His daughter is on the robotics team, second year on the robotics team. And one of her fellow team members told her that she was useless. So the conversation that I'm having with her dad is I need you not to focus on the, the young man that made that comment to your daughter. I need you to focus on your daughter. I need you to focus on her mindset. I need you to focus on what you can do to uplift her and anybody else that's in her space or your circle of influence. But that's where we are. His question to me actually was, Erica, it's 2022. How are these comments still happening? Um, and I think one of the things I'm proudest of relative to project scientists is it's not so much about having to focus on changing the world, we're changing the mindset of these girls. And it's not always about changing the person, but in this instance, right? It's about empowering them, encouraging them. So with that backdrop and with, you know, Bonnie, landing with where you ended, right? From a DEI perspective, um, again, I know we don't like to focus on the negative realities, but when you think of where we are right now, or even if you think of your hope, let's turn it around and think of your hope of the future, where do you still see some opportunities for us to make a difference? And I, I gave my personal perspective about project scientists, but where do you think project scientists can engage in some of the things you see about the future that we can change in changing those narratives? Adrian, you wanna yeah, start? I'm happy to start. Um, yeah, it's unfortunate, you know, those things happen. Um, and they're going to happen throughout all, all walks of life. Mm -hmm. I try to encourage my daughter mm -hmm. on a daily basis for mm -hmm. comments and things like that. I think that, you know, project scientists and other organizations, as well as moms, dads, you know, interactions can always just encourage um, <coughs> leadership and, and making sure that people feel confident in their own person 
because those negatives then just kind of bounce off, right? Um, so I think as much as people can build their own confidence, feel their own self-worth, understand communication is extremely important and being able to communicate with others. But I would encourage everybody in this room to go home and talk to their kids about, don't be a bully, right? Just mm -hmm. be a nice person, mm -hmm. help somebody out, lift them up mm -hmm. and do that in your career. Sometimes I see even adults being bullies. Yeah. And so I think as much as you can take somebody and say, you are very much worthy yeah. and you are very unique and special and have your own way to go about doing things um is is what i'd love to see people just do you know make somebody's just change one person's life in that sense um but project scientists i'm also part of the sim organization sim women in tech along with michelle coviella who's here um, we really focus and try to encourage that growth and that partnership and that nurturing and as much as it is about business and stem it's really about being authentic let people understand that you got challenges you understand you know some things don't go right sometimes and that it's in those moments i think that we really foster those relationships and and encourage people thank you thank you renee yeah so i, I love where you landed because what i found is that as we are more authentic um, I think that we uh, attract some of the young people more to us. Mm -hmm. I think our responsibility is to be that sponsor, mm -hmm. right? Is to recognize that there's talent and to promote that talent irrespective. And so I believe preparation meets opportunity. So the young lady continued to prepare herself for where she wants to go. And uh, those sponsors, those of us in the room, we can help with those opportunities. Um, I remember when I was um, very early in my career, um, I had a, um, a boss, my first, you know, I'm probably older than some of you. So as I look around the room, stop laughing at me. And, um, and so the boss that I had, it was, I worked for an energy company in Houston and we were having a production issue. Um, at the time, remote work existed. So you had a laptop, you take it home, you continue working in your production problem. And so he stood in my office door and he said, you can't leave until this is finished. I had a young child, six months old, and you know I had to make some phone calls and kind of work through it. But that moment I decided I was leaving that organization because that organization didn't support a working mother. And that's what it said to me. Now, of course, that wasn't necessarily the general message of the company. I just took the opportunity to say, this is not the place for me. This is not the boss for me. And so I believe it is important for us as leaders and executive to be able to sponsor those who work with us and for us and create that opportunity for them to be authentic, to be human. I know that over the past couple of years, we've learned the importance of doing that and that it's okay. It's okay if somebody has a child in the background. It's okay if someone has a cat going across the, the uh, keyboard, it's perfectly okay. And I think that that's what we've come to recognize is the importance of, you know, understanding who we are, being authentic with other people, allowing them to be authentic with us and sponsoring them to be the great person that they are. Wow. Yeah. I love everything R Renee said. I, I think first and foremost, as, as it relates to the comment, I would say prove them wrong. First and foremost, because at the end of the day, we're all human. You know, there's nothing special about any particular person. We can all be whatever we want to be, and I think you should take comments like that and use it as your fuel, yeah. right, for the next thing that you're gonna uh, go after. And, and I think you know that you learn that over time, right? Yeah. It, 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 as females, I think you know at times you you in, ingest that and it, it crumbles you as opposed to ingesting it and making you do something uh, even better with it, right? It's the fuel to your fire, if you will. So um, that's the first and foremost. I think this. I think Renee hit on a couple of things. For me, is it's experience, uh, exposure, and support. Those are the three things. I think if you can give people experiences and let them see what's out there, or maybe what they don't, they can't see themselves. I think that is certainly something uh, organizations like Project Scientists and any company or organization can do. Uh, exposing them to your network and the people around you. It's it's 
it's especially here in Charlotte, Renee and I were talking about this earlier, we're just so connected. Right? Even though we all do very different things, we're just so connected and it literally takes a minute for us to text somebody or pick up the phone or uh, you know, give somebody a connection to somebody else because a lot of us are one or two degrees from, from each other. I think it's important as far as that. And then the sponsorship, right? Do something every day to talk about somebody when they're not in their room or um, you know, uh, give them the ability to vent and hear their story and help them uh, get ahead. I love, I love, I don't know if you've ever seen them. It's the saying that says, fix somebody else's crown without telling them it was crooked. Oh, that. Yeah, that, that we all should do that every single day. Yeah. And that's not just a female thing, right? Guys can wear crowns. <laughs> it's a, honestly, I think it's if every day you could just do something um, without getting the glory for it to help support somebody else and whatever that looks like, yeah. I think those are the things that we could do. Yeah. May I add something? So um, I think, I don't know if it's Sandra or Sandra, how you pronounce it, but it's like we grew up in the same neighborhood. So when I was growing up, um, you know, in the African-American community, when you have guests coming over and you're like, oh, shoot, there's more people than I expected. <laughs> and so we used to have this old table where, OK, you guys have grandmas, you know this. You pull the table out, you add the leaf, you pull up some chairs, right? And I believe that's what needs to happen in our communities, right, in our workplaces. Pull up, the, pull out the table, you know, add a leaf, pull up some chairs, make space for additional people. And I think that that is what is going to make a difference. I appreciate how you all have reflected your individual experience, but I love the connectivity that exists between you, uh, both naturally and uh, and just from the shared experiences that you have, your connectivity is absolutely your collective superpower. And Charlotte is blessed to have this type of superpower sitting here with us, but just engaging every day with this community and making the impact that you're making. Um, thank you for sharing uh, your voice and giving uh, the perspective of, you know, again, what's real? Thank you for the vulnerability and the transparency that you've brought to this conversation. Uh, here's a question that was absolutely not in the email, but hopefully it's an easy one as we kind of close out this conversation. When you think about mentoring, you talked about sponsoring, but I'm gonna ask you in, in from the perspective of mentoring, when you think about mentoring, can you share either a favorite mentoring experience and I'll give you a whole lot of space and gratitude, you know, latitude since I did not prep you with this question. Um, but mentoring from the standpoint of either your favorite, you had the opportunity to mentor someone or you have been mentored by someone. You've been the mentee. Either are good, either work in response to this question. But again, for this audience that's sitting out there here and as well as virtually with us, what has that been for you on either side of that mentoring? I can start. Okay. Sure. Um, and uh, I wish he was watching because my mentor was actually a man. Um, great guy, Steve Humphreys. Um, as a matter of fact, I through through a leadership organization, they encourage everybody to think back across their lives and their mentors. And even if you've fallen out of touch, write them a note because it will be really meaningful for them. So we did, I did that recently. Um, but. Uh, this person gave me opportunity and support and firepower beyond anything that I was capable of. I mean, I wasn't capable of it. And he's like, yes, you were. So I think you just need to, and my, my personal opinion about mentoring is find those people that will stand up for you and maybe are different from you, right? They don't mm -hmm. have to be exactly the same, but, um, and find a variety of different mentors. I like to mentor people, um, you know, in, in, a variety of different ways, but I think the relationships that you form and the, the people that you get to know through organizations might not be dedicated mentor, but they're they're helping shape you and they are somebody that you can lean on. So good tribes are great. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you for that. My, um, I've had a couple of mentors throughout my career, but uh, the one that I want to talk about um, was one who modeled behavior. Mm. So it's it, a mentor is not just saying the right things, but also doing the things that they feel is important for you to do. And and Twyla Day as a mentor of mine, um, and I still consider her a mentor, although she's now transitioned to be a great friend. 
and she taught me the importance of one family first so you can be a great professional and that's important but you can have both and you can balance both um, when i met her she was a single parent and so she gave me the confidence that as a single parent she was progressing very well and deliberately in her career and why couldn't i do that i mean i wasn't a single parent but i had children and I had lots of children i had four and so <laughs> so i was able to in in watching her and her mentoring me as i developed throughout my career learn that i could not only be a mother, I can be a great professional, I can be a manager, I can be an executive leader because I moved through all of those stages um, as, as we worked together and talked with each other. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't that, you know, a mentor is not someone you lean on just because it's you, you are very deliberate in your conversation. I was very deliberate. And I also had a male mentor who I believe gave me a totally different perspective mm -hmm. um, because it taught me about from a male's point of view, how to be very focused, very purposeful, um, not emotional, because I think that women sometimes get, you know, a bad rap in terms of being emotional. And so I had the balance of those two mentors. And so as I, you know, talk and work with and mentor others as they come up throughout their career, I keep both of those perspectives in mind because I think that they're both critical and still be human, still be a female but not try to sway too much on the side of being a male, but being authentic and being myself. Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I think R Renee hit it. I think if you're, as it relates to mentorship, I I've, have four mentors and I've picked them up along my journey. Every stop I've made, generally a city, I pick up a different one. And what I've found is they need to look very different than me and have an extremely different perspective than me or, or they're not, or they're not my mentor. And the reason for that is you want, you obviously want somebody to listen and you want somebody to, you know, have your back and have your side, but that's not growth, right? Growth is when somebody can push you or tell you a perspective that's different than yours or make you think about something that isn't in your mind and your, your thought track. And that for me has really been super helpful throughout my career because that perspective is hugely uh, important, especially as you get higher and higher up the chain uh, of command in, in organizations, because what's around the table and what you're dealing with on an everyday is very different from the way you think and, and the way you expect things to come out of it. So uh, that that's one thing for me, just have a very diverse group of mentors uh, when, when you do pick them. And then the other thing is, you know, I think for me is everything the one common thing that my mentors have always told me is don't be anybody but yourself right? it, it, you got to be that authentic piece that we were talking about before because it will you won't show up the best way you can right there's something about each of us that makes us unique and makes us ourselves you have to bring that to the table because if you don't it won't feel right and you probably won't have the outcome uh, that you expect so that's the other thing be true to yourself uh, there's a reason you're sitting there uh, there was something there Right, that, that made them pick you, so uh, own that. Yeah. Well, in all fairness, since I just tossed that question on you, if it's okay, I'm going to answer it as well, just so I didn't put you in the fire and let you leave you there, right? Um, uh, for me, it, 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 it's two mentors. Uh, the first is actually my first role at IBM as an account executive, the white male, Alex Schutman to this day. He is now one of the greatest friends in life. Uh, but from IBM to BMC software, you know, he talked about modeling, but also he, he gave me, he helped strengthen my confidence in terms of giving me voice, giving me agency. You know, I'm this new employee out of Georgia Tech uh, coming to this team. I've inherited this account, Amarada Hess, from an account executive who had had it for 12 years and literally moved with the company from Tulsa to Houston. And I'm like, yes, please, thank you. I really needed that. But he was great, right, in terms of encouraging, inspiring, and again, just saying, you can do it. I know you've got it. Um, it doesn't matter the history of it. You've got it because it's in your hands now. So I appreciated him for that empowerment. The second person, though, is a woman who's been most instrumental in the last 10 years, really 12 years of my life. Um, her name is Viola Maxwell Thompson. She was the former president and CEO of an organization called IT Senior Management Forum. And just seeing her operate, engage, bringing her authentic self 
recognizing her skill set and what she brings to bear, but also just being human, being touchable, right? Being approachable, um, recognizing that sometimes you will have to speak truth to power. I mean, all of that was amazing to watch under her leadership and just in continuing with a friendship with her now. Um, so I just want to encourage everyone, whether you can think of yourself as being a mentor or recognizing the value of being mentored by someone, right? It doesn't matter how old you get in terms of the capacity and the value that that can yield. I uh, just want to leave and encourage that because that's something that Project Scientist does daily, daily, is mentoring, inspiring, and encouraging. And thank you so much. Deidre, Renee, Bonnie, thank you for your time. Again, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for the commitment to the work. Um, and thank you for being a part of this conversation today. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Incredible event. What incredible voices that we have had up here. What stories and lived experiences. And I, I just have to end in celebration because this is what Project Scientist brings to life, right? Not just for us who are adults and career executives and supporters of the cause, but for the girls, right? Starting at four years old, going all the way uh, through, through their education, being this force for them. Okay, so get your clapping hands ready because we're going to have a lot of celebrations right now. All right. First, I want to share a big round of applause and thanks for all of the STEM superstars. Let's hear it for them. They really bring this to life. Your stories, your insight, it helps us grow, right? Uh, Paige, give it up for Paige, everybody. Yes, that glowing smile. Woo, Paige, you are the future. You're an example. And Paige, I hope you go back and tell all your friends who have also done Project Scientists, like, get here next time. Skip second period. We got to be here. They're going to celebrate us. All right. You know, I don't know about you, but I am committed. I am ready. This is my first year on the board of Project Scientists. We are here to make dreams happen. And with that, there are so many powerful stories that we all need to share. And I want to give you a chance to mark the moment. So your clapping hands are out. I want everybody to get your cell phones out. I want you to take a moment to mark this moment. Grab whoever is next to you and get a selfie going. And later, you're going to be like in your photo roll and be like, what is going on? And you're like, that's the day. Yes, right there, right there. There are selfies. You are marking this moment in time. This is so nice. I appreciate this because you are part of the Project Scientist story. And now since you have your cell phones out, let me also <laughs> encourage you. You know, you've got your cell phones ready. And Project Scientist doesn't come to life without your support and investment. So there happens to be a code up here on the screen. Can I point to this? I encourage you not just to come with the good to know that this matters, but to come with the good to do, that you are part of the con contribution. Your investment makes a difference. As Sandy said, we have a $400,000 goal. We are about halfway there. And I would be remiss if I didn't call out my fellow board member, Julie St. John, who in an amazing way has donated $60,000 for a match that will be, yes, let's clap it out for that. Yes. And that match will make a difference in our momentum for the year ahead. So I also have to thank all of the amazing speakers and people who were honored today. Katie, yes, you were up there. Shireen, thank you for representing. Jayshree, Sandra, and Erica for leading that panel. Erica, we didn't plan the questions, but great minds think alike, right? Yes, I see you. I see you. And Bonnie and Deidre and, and Renee, yes. Thank you so much for helping this cause. So Project Scientist is going to extend our momentum all the way through Giving Tuesday, right? That's next week. Fast forward, and then there's turkey after that, okay? So get ready, get in the spirit and in the mood. But right now, I just want to end with our final thanks. I'm going to get this up on the screen because it matters so much. We have so many amazing partners, right? Morgan, you've been up here as our host and a uh, uh, STEM leader yourself, which is very cool. And, and every 
everything that Project Scientist is able to do today begins with our sponsors. So Cementity and Kathy uh, for creating this space and Lowe's for being a title sponsor today. And I also have to give it up, of course, for Train Technologies and 3M right for the JetBlue Foundation for Million Women Mentors for Sim Charlotte Dell Technologies and of course Duke Energy who has been a sponsor throughout the inception of Project Scientist we couldn't do this work alone we couldn't do this work alone and this work comes from this Project Scientist team and the board of directors directly to the girls who benefit year over year over year and it takes your investment. So thank you so much for seeing the value in this mission, for being part of the big vision for the future on behalf of the project scientist team and the board of directors. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, just a few last housekeeping things. Thank you so much for being with us today in person for everyone who joined the live stream. So as you exit the auditorium, please join us on the 25th floor where lunches will be available for pickup to eat here and where Jayshree will be signing her new recent book, which is very exciting. Um, yes, a big round of applause for that. Don't want to miss that. And then, of course, you all will leave with a gift bag and you'll get her book and one of these beautiful, fabulous STEM Girls Change the World t-shirts. So thank you guys so much for being here. And now let's all go out and change the world.